today's topic is a really interesting one and I think a nice departure from our other sessions that we've been having week to week. Um, we're talking today about controlled environment agriculture and why aren't more institutional investors looking at this space? How does it differ from traditional ag investing, traditional farmland investing? Um, what's the big deal? It, isn't it just putting a roof on top of your farm? Um, and why this maybe is a little bit more nuanced than a lot of people may have expected. So today we're super excited to have with us an old friend of Global Ag Investing and one of the leading minds in this space, Dave Chen. He's the chairman of Equilibrium. And I'm going to let Dave take it away now and uh, deliver the presentation. And I will see you again on the other side for some Q&A. Dave, welcome. We're so pleased to have you. Let's get started. Thank you. And thanks for having me. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to this session and, and, and the discussions that we're going to have. Let me just pull up the, uh, the presentation here. So uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to, 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 to give a, a little perspective on what's going on here. Um, just to set the stage, uh, to, this morning's conversation is about controlled environment agriculture. Uh, oftentimes we associate that word with uh, two models. Uh, one is the uh, glass house, high tech uh, greenhouse, and the, the other one is the, uh, the new generation of indoor farming, also known as uh, vertical farms. And, and we'll be spending a little bit of time today really focusing on, on, on both of these. Uh, but before we get going, I, I know that when we use the word greenhouse, <clears throat> oftentimes uh, you, a lot of folks still imagine that when we talk about greenhouse, uh, we're talking about the, the plastic hoop house or the, the, the Quonset hut looking like thing uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, we grow sometimes in the dirt. Uh, what we're really talking about here and for the rest of this presentation is the high tech uh, controlled environment. In other words, an enclosed structure, uh, typically glass and steel, and uh, typically where you're managing uh, the oxygen level, the CO2 level, uh, the temperature, uh, the humidity, and also the lighting protocol. And whether that's completely indoors or whether that's uh, the use of these large uh, glass structures where you're augmenting sunlight with, uh, with uh, 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 LED and other forms of, of lighting. Uh, I'll point you to this picture, and, 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 and part of this is to give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about. The upper left picture is our Camarillo, California uh, asset. That's 125 acres. And in general, that'll produce roughly 40 million kilograms a year of output. So call it 90 million pounds. Every morning, uh, 20 or more semi trucks leave that facility. And you, if you look carefully in the picture, you can see a, a picture of a semi to give you a sense of the scale. Uh, it's 11 months out of the year production. And, and you're looking at somewhere around about $90 million of, of revenue a year. In the lower left uh, is our uh, Moorhead, Kentucky uh, facility, and that's about 60 acres. And uh, you can take most of those numbers that I just quoted and roughly just cut them by half and, and you'll get very close to, to what that looks like. In, in both of these pictures, when you step back, you get a sense of the scale that's taking place here. The uh, picture in the middle is a, a leafy greens facility in our uh, 10 acres that's in uh, Minnesota. And one of the things that you'll notice is not only the density, uh, but the mixed crops that are being used and uh, frankly, lack of people. And what you'll see in a, in a leafy greens greenhouse is a tremendous amount of automation. Uh, 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 so to the point where uh, the, the, the issues of safety are, are, are paramount. Uh, there's almost no contact uh, during the growing cycle, and the growing cycles can be anywhere between 16, 17 to 25 days, and so you have a rapid continuous flow process where plants at one end are, are, are babies and they're full grown and harvested, oftentimes fully automated at the other end. And then, uh, of course, we've got the tomato facility, and then we've got a lower tech uh, berry facility, also in California. Hopefully, that gives you a sense of the topic that we're talking about. Uh, before I kick into the main topic that Kate introduced, uh, I, I want to just introduce uh, Equilibrium so you have a, a sense of the calibration. We, we're focused on 
uh, working uh, in primarily agriculture and what I would call agricultural distributed infrastructure. So our portfolios that we manage uh, are made up of things like waste water, waste energy. We're one of the leaders in producing renewable natural gas and electricity from uh, farm and food waste. Uh, we focus on water productivity technologies, water recycling, water treatment, water asset management. And then we operate a portfolio in production at scale controlled environment. Uh, the ability to apply the, the technologies in the field, automation, uh, the water and energy infrastructure associated with controlled environment. And then of course, uh, the product packaging and logistics of it. I think what makes us unique as an investor is that we uh, operate, we're not just investors, we're operators of the assets. Uh, we bring expertise in managing uh, production, bring expertise in uh, uh, the design and, uh, and build of these uh, greenhouse uh, infrastructure as well as our uh, renewable uh, infrastructure uh, facilities. Uh, we're process and technology literate and, uh, and we've also built this entire uh, portfolio and our company Equilibrium around uh, sustainability. I won't go through this, but one of the things that we've done over the last, uh, really since our inception, is focus not so much on sustainability as a reporting uh, mechanism, but really sustainability as an operational tool to increase productivity and to increase the economics of our portfolio. And this picture really brings the light, you know, bringing it all together, both in terms of the high capacity, high production uh, uh, facilities that, that, that we're building into our portfolios that we're focusing on, but also building resilience and scalability uh, uh, into sustainability. And, and you can see in some of the, the, the fine print here, some of the attributes. So, so building sustainability into uh, a sustainable advantage, but also into a, a very strong uh, returns oriented uh, set of assets. Uh, the black and white picture is something we're very proud of. That's our Mona, Utah facility. And that's where we're actually attached to a uh, 500 megawatt uh, Berkshire Hathaway energy uh, gas fired power plant. And we literally are sucking a tailpipe. We are bringing in hot air and, uh, and CO2 from uh, the power plant and using it as part of the uh, HVAC and using it as part of the CO2 that we're uh, using within the, uh, the daytime uh, of the greenhouse. So at any point in time during the day, we'll have uh, twice the atmospheric CO2 uh, and, and it's back to your third grade class, science class where plants consume CO2 and use it to produce biomass and oxygen as part of their photosynthetic cycle. So we're implementing sustainability as a core advantage uh, into our assets. We've had a long history at Equilibrium of firsts. We were the first uh, uh, in 2008 to introduce a green building real estate strategy. In other words, uh, how does green real estate create competitive advantage? We were the first in 2011 to introduce a pure play sustainable permanent crop strategy. Uh, in 2012, uh, the first closed loop wastewater energy strategy. And then in 2017, we introduced uh, the first uh, high tech production greenhouse uh, uh, agricultural portfolio. So we continue to drive that, 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 that innovation process. At the heart of our company and, and the way that we do our investment strategy development is that we're value chain uh, analysts. And we're always looking at the value chain and asking how is the status quo changing? And is there a major disruptor that, that changes the economics of the value chain that gives us an entry point to build a value added portfolio? And, and one of the things that, that, that I've talked about in previous GAI sessions in Japan and in, in London is, is the fact that, that, that our observation and our analysis is that every part of the agriculture to food value chain is in flux. Uh, and, and, and we frame it as a series of questions, where we grow our food, <clears throat> how we grow our food, how we get our food, what we eat, every part of that value chain is now in flux and it's being driven by sustainability and technology factors. And, and if you look at the, the, the stuff in the green, 
So they're all stuff that you're familiar with. But when you superimpose all that uh, across the value chain, you get a sense of how much change is taking place everywhere from the genomics to automation, robotics, plant-based alt proteins, all the way through to how we get our food. The difference between a Walmart distribution center versus an Alibaba or an Amazon fulfillment center, uh, the move towards ready to eat and delivery, et cetera. And the final conclusion is that, that we see agriculture transitioning uh, into a tech platform for skilled production. And even though we're real assets, we are real assets investors. Uh, if you tear apart our real assets, and, and, and I think the greenhouse behind me is a great example, it's, it's becoming less of a farm and more of a set of infrastructure elements. There's in every one of these greenhouses, there's a water management uh, and water treatment uh, facility. There's an energy uh, and energy management facility. There's an automation uh, facility or, or, or infrastructure layer. Uh, there's a climate management infrastructure layer. And then of course, there's the real assets, which is the steel and glass construction, but it contains these very real technology platforms. And so it becomes, well, that's part of the punchline of this morning's conversation. This becomes less of a farm and much more in, in many ways of a technology platform operating company. And, and, and in, in, and the final punchline is that agriculture, in, in our opinion, is transitioning increasingly to becoming an infrastructure sector. The farm itself is becoming a set of layered infrastructure elements. So uh, it, it, where are we today as, as equilibrium in controlled environment agriculture? Our, our, our strategy has been to actively partner with leading greenhouse operators and technology firms to build out our real asset portfolio. In the last 24 months, we've built out a significant North American market share in vine crops, leafy greens, and berries. And it's a, it's a portfolio that is, that is generating uh, both um, high value as a real asset, but also current income. And we invest in really two uh, formats. One is as facilities expansion equity. In other words, direct investment, equity investment in the greenhouses and the controlled environment foods facilities, as well as uh, corporate expansion equity, where we'll partner and directly invest in some of the leading uh, controlled environment foods uh, operating companies. Our, our report card to date is that we've uh, deployed somewhere around about $550 million, which puts us, I think, as uh, uh, the de facto leader in this category at this point in time in North America. And uh, Global Ag Invest would rank us at, our, at about number 16 in, in uh, farmland investors. So usually at that point in the, in the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll start rolling out a series of data points about the market and about the changes. But, but in my conversation about this seminar, oh, probably about a month ago, Jarrett Rose, who's the CEO of GAI, asked me this question. And he said, hey, Dave, before you go on, um, why aren't more LPs and ag fund managers doing this? And for those of you guys that know, you know I'm a pretty paranoid and, uh, and, uh, and uh, humble person. My immediate answer to Jarrett, well, they are. But, but my second answer, you know, after I had a moment to think about it, uh, is what I'd actually like to talk about for the rest of my time here. So why aren't more LPs and ag fund and managers uh, doing this? You know, if you step back, ag investing has historically been uh, really three key components. Uh, historically, it's been about the land, it's about the aging farmer, and it's about feeding the global growing population. And if you tear it apart and tease apart the investment thesis, ag investing has centered around the fact that land, uh, you know, that old joke, you know, land, God isn't creating any more of it. And so it's a, it's a play on scarcity. It's a play on this wonderful attribute of farmland, which is that over decades, it's had long-term appreciation trends and very steady through cycles. And then the third is very important, and, and that is that it's viewed as a store of wealth and as an inflation hedge. 
In other words, because it has long-term appreciation, even if the short-term commodity risks uh, fluctuate, and some years the land may produce more, may produce less, the market, commodity markets may pay more, may pay less, the land itself, because of its asset value, has been viewed as a store of wealth and inflation hedge. And so for large pensions, uh, it's been viewed as, as part of a capital preservation uh, strategy, as well as the ability to earn current income on top of that. The second factor that, 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 that pervades the conversation about ag investing is the aging farmer. Uh, viewed and 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 they're all, all almost all countries have the same statistic, and that is that the farm the farmer population is anywhere between mid to late fifties through to the late sixties, and so it's a compelling transition of that. It's time to sell. Oftentimes the heirs don't want it, uh, so therefore it's a buying opportunity, and it's an opportunity to consolidate and gain scale. So the aging farmer. The third one is, 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 I jokingly say, you know, food and agriculture is low on the Maslow hierarchy of needs. It's one of the basic elements. You got to eat. Uh, there's a growing global middle class uh, asking for better food and, and better diversity. And as a result of that, it's got cycle and, and, and shock resistant characteristics to it. And, and so that's been the basis of, of ag investing. When you look at controlled environment agriculture, it's pretty different. It's, uh, it's, it's basis of, of, of existence is a whole set of different words. It's about distributed abundance. It's about alternative and new resources. It's not land centered. It's very product and user centered we don't talk a lot about the old farmer and we talk about this word inflection and I, and I want to spend a little bit more time about that. But, but when you look at these words, let's take a couple of examples. When we talk about alt protein uh, and plant-based protein and how different it is and, and just sort of think about that for a second. If upwards of 50 to 60% of all the ag economy and ag lands are somehow related to livestock, you can see how land, land use, feed, uh, uh, the, the livestock themselves uh, is, is, is very much about the resource and productivity of land. When we shift to this conversation about plant-based protein and alternative protein, the conversation is no longer about land use, land availability, where's the best grazing lands. It now shifts to the product, how consumers will want the product, and what are then the production facilities that are necessary to create that format of product. And then how do we source the source material, whether it's pea protein, whether it's soy protein, uh, and, and how do we think about the sourcing and the quality and quantity of those sources so the conversation shifts completely in terms of, of where we're at in the value chain. So let's, and the, and the final thing that I'll say on this is the Kafka CEO gave a great talk about three years ago at the uh, Tomasic Ecosperity Conference. And, and he made this comment that every country and every country's policymakers uh, uh, have this conversation at some point, which is to lament and wonder how we get young people uh, to become farmers again. And the Kafka CEO made a pretty strong statement that that was the wrong question. The right question is how do we uh, create careers for young people in the next generation of the food and ag industry? And what he was really signaling was, again, the punchline that ag is becoming a tech platform, a scaled platform, and it's becoming an infrastructure. And, and, and so we have this reframing of how do we get kids back into farming to how do we create uh, a farm infrastructure and a farm agriculture career. So let's drill into this. 
And, and I think that one of the questions that, 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 that I stepped back and thought about was, well, and, and by the way, I, I spent 25 years before I entered the, uh, the uh, ag investing area, 25 years in, in, in high tech, and much of that in, uh, in venture capital. And, and so you get to see a bunch of, of things called inflections. And when you think about inflections in marketplaces, I, I think there's, there's a number of things that, that are factors that, that drive the intensity and timing of inflection. One is the demand. The second one is that, that the technology begins to hit Moore's law. And this is the first time I ever thought I'd use the word Moore's law in an ag uh, presentation. But, but when, and, and I use Moore's law as a, as a, as a proxy. Moore's law, as most of you know, is that, uh, that the semiconductor industry is, has, has been on a steady pace for decades of 2x the performance in every two years. But what it really means is a steady cost reduction uh, and uh, a dramatic uh, uh, long-term trend in price, performance, and productivity uh, increases. And, and the, the, the third factor is converging, what I would call converging compound technologies. And that is, it's not just one technology, it's that a confluence of things start to add up and you begin to get this, this dramatic inflection that takes place, resulting in uh, replacement and substitute products and resulting in new functionality and new models. And, and many of you are familiar with the upper di right diagram, which is uh, the technology S curve. And you can see how these things, and, and think about it, why do you invest in electric cars? Uh, because we're convinced that the uh, internal combustion engine has hit the, uh, the asymptotic part of its, of its technology curve and that the electric drive is on the steep part of its, of its inflection and productivity curve. But we also know that what made electric cars 20 years ago different from electric cars today is the confluence of, of technologies, including GPS, including uh, AI for self-driving automobiles, uh, you know, in a, in a joking way, uh, uh, an electric car is now a smartphone with wheels. And so you can take that same analogy. And now the question that you have to step back and ask is, are those factors starting to take place in agriculture? So Kate and, and, and Garrett asked the question, hey, isn't controlled environment just putting a roof on top of the land? What's the big deal? And I would, I would ask you to think about this greenhouse in, in four ways. First, it's not about the land or the geography or the soil or the climate anymore. Think about a land-based agricultural strategy. It's all about the fact that some piece of land or climate in a region is ideally suited to a crop. And, and there's a scarcity there. Controlled environment agriculture, I jokingly put BYO, bring your own, and do it yourself. You know, controlled environment agriculture, I'll, I'll exaggerate a little bit. Uh, it effectively allows you to grow many things, not everything, but many things, almost anywhere you want. I, I, I for example, just recently um, uh, made a, an investment in in a greenhouse in Abu Dhabi. So there you know that the summertime temperature, which is let's say about nine months out of the year, is somewhere between 33 degrees centigrade and 45 degrees centigrade, and it's high humidity. And during the winter, it can be 10 degrees centigrade and it might climb up to 33 degrees, 34 degrees centigrade. That's a pretty extreme climate. And yet they're able to grow tomatoes and we believe over time other crops um, cost effectively and productively and at high quality within that kind of environment. We know that, 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 that these technologies have been used flexibly across many parts of the world. We also know, for example, that plants need different, not only climate, but different soil type. So each of these plants in back of me here uh, are actually literally grown in a, in a form of media, whether that's organic coconut husk or rock wool or forms of, 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 of soil uh, amended medium. But effectively, they're customized soil, customized to the plant, customized to the climate. 
And so it's not about the land anymore. And, and I jokingly say that um, many countries, many regions have basically uh, benefited from something that's grossly outside of their control, which is that geography and geology uh, created a circumstance where they had a soil adapted to certain kinds of crops, which allowed them to be part of certain types of supply chains. If you now create this distributed abundance model, you bring your own. The second major difference in this greenhouse setting is that in effect, you're managing a technology company. So you're riding a rate of change. And so if you look at the long-term multi-decade agriculture, field agriculture has been growing at about one and one and a half percent productivity curve. So it's been very consistent and very steady, and it's been very positive. Controlled environment agriculture has been on about a three to 5% historic productivity curve. And we believe, given the evidence that we're seeing, that we're about ready to enter an inflection on the controlled environment area, where we're entering a steeper part of the productivity curve, and we estimate that it could be as high as 10% per year. Wagen University uh, has been conducting uh, in the controlled environment area uh, a set of competitions over the last couple of years. Uh, the autonomous greenhouse. Can a greenhouse be controlled by AI? And I won't give you all the details. It would be, we'd spend too much time on it. But, but effectively, um, they pit five teams against a Dutch uh, greenhouse grower top gun team. And this last year, the top two teams uh, beat by a long shot, uh, the productivity, quality, and sustainability input factors of the top gun team, in one case by almost two X. That has huge ramifications for the implications of riding the technology S curve. And the same reason that, that someone would invest in Tesla because Tesla is riding a technology S-curve uh, is something that, that, that I think we're looking at here within the context of CEA. We also see multiple technologies converging on the CEA model. Genetics, robotics, automation, AI, uh, even something as mundane as the next generation of, of uh, uh, fertilizers and uh, process technologies for the growing and maintenance. Uh, we see convergence happening in CEA in the context of, of vegetable preservation and packaging. So again, these are all factors that are converging at the same time and it's driving the productivity and enhancement of value within your asset. We see a new competitive, and I'm almost gonna use the word human resource model. And that is uh, the ability to adopt, integrate, and operate constantly and consistently. You're basically implementing and sourcing technology constantly. You look like a tech company. And you have to have the adequate scale and margins uh, and infrastructure in, in order to be able to sustain that level of human resource and that level of, of, of adoption. The third is pretty interesting and, and, and it's not intuitively obvious and that is the capital and business model of a CEA farm is fundamentally different. So remember one of the reasons that you invest in land is that it's a store of value. So let's say you're a farmer in Salinas, California and you've got a thousand acres and a Salinas Valley uh, acre of land is let's just say it's $40,000. So in, in, in very real terms, if I haven't put a lot of debt on my land, I'm $40 million wealthy. Whether I have a good year or a bad year, I still have the store of wealth in this thing called land. $40,000 an acre, $40 million. That's not terribly different from an institutional land portfolio. But, but now we look at, at a greenhouse or a vertical farm and the land underneath that 
the roof on top of the land, is in fact de minimis. Uh, a, a leafy greens greenhouse is two and a half million dollars per acre. So that's two and a half million dollars versus $40,000 that it sits on. So literally, um, the land is, is almost an afterthought, but it also has business model implications. It means that instead of managing the crops and the gross margin that sits on top of that $40,008 acre, I'm now managing a CapEx investment and an operating infrastructure asset worth two and a half million dollars on top of a $40,000 acre. It changes the entire business model and it changes the entire perspective 180 degrees. And so how do you adapt to that? And it's one of the reasons we've seen very few field farmers, no matter how wealthy they are and how large they are, make that jump to becoming controlled environment farmers. And then the last thing is really heady and it is not intuitively obvious, and that is response time. So if I'm a farmer and I'm listening and paying attention to my market signals, the commodity markets and the future macroeconomic forecasts, I'm trying to make crop decisions at least a year, maybe a year and a half in advance. In these greenhouses, and I'll take the most extreme example, in a leafy greens greenhouse, my planting decision and my development of skews could literally be a 21-day responsive to market signal cycle. Think about that for a moment, and we won't spend much time on that, but that is also a game changer. Because you're integrated in with the production and the packaging, in another way, that makes you responsive to market signals within days. So 21 to 30 days on the planting side, market signals on the productization and packaging side, literally within days. That, that changes your ability to be adaptive to the market and responsive to your customer. And again, what I said earlier, a focus on the product and a focus on the customer. So, in some ways, I hope I've answered why this is a big deal. And we're not over. We've got CEA is going to be increasingly applied across categories. Uh, we're already seeing it in the berries. We're seeing more kinds of leafy greens being brought indoors. You see pilots in Holland uh, with bok choy and other Asian vegetables. We see the, 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 the continued push onto new proteins, genetics, preservation packaging, and we are seeing the practical implementation of data and AI. So this treadmill, this inflection S-curve that we're on, we think is just at the beginning. And then there's a whole host of continued, I'll call them almost policy, or macroeconomic drivers of change. Uh, we're seeing some of the, the, the climate challenged uh, economies around the world uh, really looking at how do we shorten the supply chain? How do we build food security into our country's policy? Uh, how do we build an agricultural supply chain that's climate resilient and climate adaptive? If anything, COVID has brought to bear the fragileness of a supply chain and the fact that you have to be thinking about very proactively food security. And it has to be done in the context of both the length of the supply chain, the globalness of the supply chain, the interdependency, but also climate. And so these will become factors as we think about, again, BYO and DIY. Regionalism and nationalism not only the consumer side of this, which is I want a regional access to more and more of my food, I want re uh, source traceability, but there's also now the nationalism, the trade policies, the difficulty of trade routes, getting a truck or a ship from one end of the world to the next. 
whether it's from difficulty in, in, in COVID or whether it's by national policy and trade restrictions. We now have both a consumer face to this and we also have a national public policy face to this. And then the last is labor. Uh, labor across the world is getting more and more scarce. It's diminishing in terms of the, uh, the, the, the balance of an aging population to a young population. Uh, the availability of inexpensive labor, which is what much of agriculture is dependent upon, is also, you can see the trajectory of that. And so how does automation uh, and, and uh, other factors like that uh, fare into this? And then what's the response of the agricultural community? So again, I won't go through this in any great detail, but when we step back, we think that there are tremendous numbers of discontinuous moments, opportunity sets that are taking place in agriculture. Uh, we see disruptions taking place across the entire value chain. And so we think this is perhaps one of the most exciting sectors. Said another way, almost every major economic industrial sector over the last two decades has been remade by technology, by the internet, by e-commerce, uh, by the implementation of technology to change the economics. And in some ways, ag is one of the last, and we think it's now hit inflection. We think that CEA is one of the uh, proof points and one of the fulcrum points of this change. And we think this is a long-term trend, and we see tremendous number of opportunities uh, available uh, in this in this set of changes. So I'll end there and uh, we've got, I think, plenty of time for some questions. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dave. I would attend your class at any university, any semester, any time. This was excellent and so informative. And I think it's, it, it's probably getting a lot of people like it is for me, very excited about the possibilities here. Um, I want to start the first question with sort of where you started the presentation, which is sustainability. I know a lot of our um, our friends who are traditional farmland investors are seeking ways to quantify sustainability. And I assume in a controlled environment, uh, you'll, you probably have a lot more tools at your disposal to do that. Um, can you talk a little bit about sustainability metrics and how they differ in a controlled environment versus traditional farmland? Yeah, I, I, in, in some ways, I don't think it, cha it changes that much. I, I think you're right. We have greater visibility. I mean, literally, we have a big old meter uh, sitting on, 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 the, on the glass house. We're monitoring at the plant level. But a lot of field agriculture is also starting to do those things, you know, sensors across the field, emitters and irrigation across the field. So I, I think there are some similarities. I think the main point, though, of sustainability metrics is a lot of the conversation about metrics um, has been around, I think, two things. One is uh, reporting uh, how we're doing to investors and reporting how we tick specific boxes for purposes of certification. And I'm thinking fair trade, you know, rainforest, uh, timber, you know, things like that, FSC. And I'm also thinking about things like uh, some of the standards that, 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 that we're being held to. I think that from our point, and, and, and I subtly put this into the slide uh, early on, uh, our focus has been on operationalizing sustainability. And so some of the metrics that we're looking at are, and I'll just throw a few out, things like um, gross margin per BTU, right? uh, gross margin or productivity per liter of water. Uh, I'll give you a funny story. Um, Early on when we were fundraising for Controlled Environment Foods Fund One, uh, we were uh, in a, a, a pitch meeting with a very sophisticated uh, agriculture uh, LP. And, and we've got our whole team and we're pitching and we're having a great time and answering questions. And the LP asks uh, our, our uh, team member, that's our uh, uh, Controlled Environment uh, Domain Expert, he looks at him and he says, what's your productivity per, per acre feet of water and how much do you use? 
and he, and he, and he couldn't answer the question. And, and, and I'm thinking, wait, a how can we possibly not answer this question? And, and, and our, and our, and our, and our teammate was absolutely stumped. And, uh, and, and, and he puts his head down and he starts writing and about, and, and we move on to a different part of the question and, and to, to, to answering this. And about two or three minutes later, he, he, he says, Hey, listen, uh, I, I have your answer. And, and the reason I couldn't answer your question is that in a greenhouse, we never use acre feet. Uh, we use how many liters of water our plants consume per square meter. And we know how many liters we use. And we measure how many liter productivity. So we think of an acre feet as a complete waste. So, so, so it, in some ways, you're, you're, you're thinking about this in a very different paradigm. And it almost starts with the resource management. Got it. Um, I'm, so let's stay on the productivity because we do have a couple of questions on that that I'm going to try to combine um, into one. So when you're comparing when you're comparing productivity, uh, there's a question about whether it's apples to apples since a lot of field farming are you know commodity crops and things like that. And so how are you getting to that number of differentiation? And then can you talk about the the outlook or the prospect for commodity cropping in this environment? Yeah, and 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 remember, we're 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 uh, most of what we're talking about is the stuff behind me. Yeah, right? you know, we're talking about green peppers, and uh, and we're talking about uh, colored peppers. We're talking about cucumbers. We're talking about eggplants. We're talking about tomatoes. We're talking about romaine lettuce. Right. So so when we talk about comparables we typically think about the productivity per acre of field. We think about the inputs per acre of field. And we typically think about the full, and this is a very difficult number to get to, but the full life cycle of how much water and how much energy is used to, and, and, and also how much shrinkage is involved uh, in the various stages of getting that vegetable into the marketplace. When we take a look at, at, at these facilities, uh, we're looking at the, the, the same thing. How much input per meter? What's the productivity per meter? And, and, and what's the shrinkage per meter or per output? And then how does that then look at water and energy consumption across uh, the footprint into the marketplace? And, and I would say that the easiest one to look at is water productivity, where in some cases we're, you know, 90% or more uh, 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 more efficient of water consumption than a comparable field crop pound for pound. Uh, and with energy, uh, it's comparable. And how do we think about this? Uh, we think about the total output on, a, on an annualized basis. How do we benchmark this uh, in uh, many of our crops um, in a horizontal greenhouse? You know, you're looking at per acre output uh, apples to apples, um, anywhere between 20 to one to upwards of 50 or 60 to, to, to one in, in terms of the comparable output per acre. Wow. All right, and then uh, when you get into, sorry to interrupt, but when you get no, into go ahead. farms, when you get into vertical farms, now I'm using layers, I get a lower productivity per square meter, but I get more layers, but I also add complexity. So you get pluses and minuses that when you, when you put that together, you get a little bit more energy usage, you get a little bit less this, and, and, and when you put all that together, and that's how many of the vertical farms sort of get to their algorithm, which is that they're you know, 100 times more productive than the comparable field, uh, but that's partly because they're stacking. So, so you've got to look at these numbers carefully. So since you brought it up, I mean, there are a lot of questions coming in, but I, and I was holding that one for a minute, but since you are already on vertical, let's talk about that a little bit and where you see vertical and someone else had a question about container farming. You know, how do those fit into this segment uh, in your mind? Yeah, I, I think that um, um, We just, we've been asked to have this conversation recently, which is very unusual, I think, for an ag investment manager. We, we've been asked to have this conversation at the national policy level with a number of, of countries outside the United States. 
where they're asking this question of, of implementing uh, a, a next generation ag uh, food uh, public policy and, and how do we think about mixing and matching these pieces. And, and I would say that, that there's a human tendency to want to see everything in black and white. And that is that vertical farms will take over 100% and there'll be no field. Uh, 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 greenhouses will take over and there'll be no field. Uh, the container uh, will make every restaurant their own farm or every store their own farm and we won't need greenhouses or the field. <laughs> And I think that, that what people have to, 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 to think about is uh, we can never avoid the fact that we are always talking about quantity. We're talking about various cost mechanisms and we're always talking about optimizing for the user experience. And so there isn't any one answer in almost every ag policy and, and therefore every ag portfolio is, is gonna be made up of a number of these, of these solutions. Right. We think that containers, until you get to very, very highly mechanized and very uh, AI adaptive systems, are going to be very difficult because you have a, you have, frankly, you have an overhead issue. I don't have enough rack space. I don't have enough square footage. And I don't have enough master growers to go around. And master growers now are $150,000 to $200,000 kind of, 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 of human resource. All right. And, and so, so when does that adapt? Vertical farms, what crops actually grow really, really well within that kind of environment? And what can be done in a vertical greenhouse and that kind of control mechanism that can't be done here or in the field? So I think that's one answer to your question. I think the second answer to your question is there's a very typical pattern that takes place in technology adoption. And, and this gets a little wonky, but the first phase of almost any new technology is to do what you did yesterday, except faster, better, cheaper. But about three years into any next generation technology, uh, you see something else happening, which is somebody wakes up one morning and says, well, wait a minute, given this technology platform that yes, I can do faster, better, cheaper, but what does it allow me to do fundamentally differently that no one ever thought of before, all right? And, and we see this in, in the greenhouses with proliferation of new kinds of tomatoes, new hybrids. Uh, we're seeing this happening in the berries area. So, so things that can no longer grow in the field, but now need the controlled environment. Uh, and we're gonna see the same kind of thinking take place within things like containers and within verticals. So we think that, that the farm footprint of the future is going to be how these pieces and how we learn from the various technologies from these pieces and adapt them across both a spectrum of use, but also how they co-mingle themselves and get integrated across uh, these, these formats. Okay, great. Let's talk a little bit about cost. A lot of people are interested in, in costs um, and, and any limits to size of the farm. So there are questions from people who are operators, but also people who are investors in terms of the costs that you incur from a startup perspective, and then also the ongoing costs as it compares to a traditional farm. Yeah. Um, how the greenhouse industry has grown in Holland uh, over the last, let's call it four decades, is fundamentally different than the way it is taking shape in China, the way it took shape in Russia, the way it's taking place in North America. And, and that's not a judgment. That's just, you know, it, it, the, the greenhouse industry had the opportunity over, over the, 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 the 40 years in Holland to grow steadily and uh, with a great deal of control. And the expansion was a very steady expansion. And, and they grew the way a lot of farms grow. Hey, we had a good year. We have a, a million euro to spare. Let's go, let's go expand a greenhouse by uh, an acre or two. What's happening, and, and, and perhaps the most important, compelling reason that we entered uh, the greenhouse uh, North American sector was a conversation that we had about four years ago uh, with the largest uh, grocery retailer in the United States. And the head of, of, of their 
produce procurement said to us in a, in a meeting, Hey, you need to understand something. And, and we, this is the voice of that retailer. We serve middle income America and in fact, below middle income America. So everybody that we serve is on a budget. And so when they put something into their food basket, they're taking something out of their food basket. And, and, and they're putting in a better quality of produce, even in that middle income uh, segment of the, of the demographic. And a large part of that is greenhouse grown. So better tomatoes, better quality peppers. And when we left that meeting, we believed that, that this was the most compelling piece of due diligence that we could walk out with. And that is that, that the market had inflected. You can't, you can't buy change in a marketplace, but you can spot it. And we saw that, which meant that we forecasted that, that greenhouses would start to grow, not at five acres at a time, but that the kind of expansion was going to grow into the 50 acre, 100 acre expansions. We saw the same thing happening in other parts of the country, of the, of the, of the, of the world, uh, and that the knee of the curve had hit on demand side. So, so to answer your question, what's the scale? If you look at it, a few years ago, scale in tomatoes was 10 acres. Scale today, we believe, is in modules of 25 to 30 acres, with modules growing up into four by, you know, four by 25, 100 acres. We see leafy greens going from one acre. So in the United States, we have plenty of one acre small leafy greens operations. We see leafy greens uh, table stakes now being 10 acres to 20 acres for leafy greens with N by 20 acres. So you end up with a farm that looks like modules of, of two or three expansion slots each of them 20 acres. You do the quick math, 20 acres times $2.5 million, that's $58 million a hunk, that's a $150 million sort of three-phase project. All right, part of this is you need to absorb the overhead, the technology overhead, you need to absorb uh, basically the packaging uh, overhead, but more importantly, you have to be now the appropriate scale to be able to serve a distribution center. All right. So you have to have the human resources, you have to have the technology platform, and you have to be big enough to serve your customer who's no longer just looking at this as a sideline. Intense. I, I'm trying to figure out where to go exactly from there, but I think I want to, while we're just inside the facility mentally, um, we have some questions about lighting um, and LED lighting versus um, sunlight or as a supplement to sunlight. Can you talk a little bit about how you evaluated and continue to evaluate um, different lighting resources? So this sounds incredibly uh, obvious and simplistic, right? But the center of everything is the plant and the climate, all right? It's not the productivity. It's not the labor, uh, it's, it's what climate is appropriate to get the most and the healthiest plant and the, and the output from the plant. And so if you're so lucky to be, for example, uh, let's take Mexico. Mexico, just from a, a position on the earth and the equator and therefore the sunlight, uh, uh, you uh, likely need very little lighting because the sun is incredibly consistent, All right? If you're in Minnesota and uh, parts even further north uh, where we have you know, upwards of seven, eight hours of, uh, of daylight in the winter, uh, you're going to need supplemental lighting to create the healthiest environment to focus on the plant. So there is no question, there is no answer to, uh, to do I need lighting or not? It, it really is about the plant and the climate and, and where you are positionally with the sunlight. The same goes for the kind of light. Should you use hybrid lights, sodium, or should you use LEDs? Again, that depends on the kind of cropping that you're doing, the kind of crop that you're doing and where you're at. But these are all economic, not, not ideological, but economic-based decisions based on maintaining the health and productivity of this long live asset. 
Yeah, that makes but, sense. Lights that are, makes but lights sense. are but lights are here and they're that critically makes, important. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, since you said a long life asset, someone did ask what the lifespan of a typical greenhouse like that one would be. So I'll give you a slightly snarky answer. So there are places in the world where uh, they like high tech, but they don't take care of the toys very well. And you can walk into a greenhouse after three years and it doesn't look great. You can walk into Holland and you can imagine the Dutch mentality. You can walk into a 40 year old greenhouse and it looks like it's brand new and you can eat off the floor. All right. So these are glass and steel construction. The way we think about it is we have life cycles for HVAC, life cycles for the replacement of lights, life cycle for the continual upgrade of automation and, and uh, 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 control systems. And so in general, somewhere between seven and 10 years, the guts of how we manage the platform inside the greenhouse will go through its iteration or continual upgrade. All right. But the shell structure itself, if you take care of it and continue to upgrade, um, there's no reason that these things can't last 25 to 40 years. And in fact, the Dutch have done that. And in parts of Leamington, Ontario, you have the same attribute. But if you don't take care of it, and this is why I think that point was so important, you don't just have land to take care of now. In this case, the land is de minimis. You now have basically a big hunk of CapEx and operating asset that you have to take care of. And if you leave your car factory uh, unmaintained, it won't take but 10 years for your car factory to, 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 to become a maintenance headache, a high cost asset. If you maintain it every day, keep it upgraded, uh, you'll have a long life asset. Yeah, very good. Um, we've had some uh, Mexico and Canada questions and you touched on both of those in, in a couple of your recent answers. Um, so I will get back to those if we have time, but I wanted to ask, um, uh, Bob says, much of what you've said applies to the technology breakthroughs in controlled environment land-based uh, recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, since 2018, he says there have been over $13 billion uh, in facilities announced. What's your thesis on the aquaculture sector as part of the, the greater whole? Uh... Suffice to say that we've been spending a lot of time in aquaculture the same way that we spent two years walking around. Uh, you know, one of our guys proudly says that he drove 4,000 kilometers around Holland, um, which is not an easy feat to do. Uh, we spent the time really drilling into aquaculture and the various forms of aquaculture. And, and remember, we have a sustainability lens that we look through everything. Does, is there a sustainability value add and competitive advantage? So uh, I won't go into any great detail, but to the person that asked that question, uh, we agree. And when we agree, we usually put our money to work. Okay, great. Um, I think you mentioned this, that this is part of a larger puzzle, that you don't, you don't foresee that this will in any way take the place of more traditional farming, that it will always be one of the tools that the human race utilizes to um, to feed the world. You know, I get excited in thinking about the prospects for this. You know, can we colonize Mars? Can you know? Are there are there bigger implications for this? And what does that look like? I love the phrase that you used um, about distributed abundance as well. And I think that you know, it's a charming notion and and one that we will hopefully continue to see more of um hey, they're just yeah i'm gonna interrupt you i don't think it's a charming uh <laughs> and, and, and I'm, i don't mean that negatively so 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 let me give you a, a very crass example all right there are name it 20 places around the world where the country borders won the dinosaur lottery all right um they're sitting on top of dead dinosaurs so they have oil wealth wasn't anything the country did. It was kind of random because they didn't actually know it was underneath the ground when they drew the borders of the country. Think what wind and solar has done. Every, almost every place in the world now is an energy producer. That's distributed abundance. You know, Minnesota or South Dakota, well, that's a bad example because they have frack gas, but you know, pick a place that doesn't have uh, uh, any hydrocarbons. And they're now an energy producing country. 
right? And so it, 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 it literally, I, I think that, 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 that makes this uh, concept of, of abundance, distributed abundance, not just a, 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 a kitschy term. It, it really is something that's happened, right? You know, it wasn't that long ago, you know, three decades ago, only the most sophisticated companies in the world could afford computers. Right. And, and so, so just, so think about it in that context and, and, uh, only, only a certain number of countries could afford to be energy producers. Now everybody, everybody's an energy producer. Hell, your house is an energy producer. Right. Absolutely. You're, you're so right. And, and I think it's an exciting future as dark as days seem now, there are so many ways that agriculture as a whole can improve and grow and you know it is the best place to play um i think for a lot of us we all believe that um let's let's have a future looking statement someone is asking you know which which universities and courses of study will produce the talent necessary for this sector to thrive i'm going to answer that in two ways um one is that um uh one of our most respected, aggressive, mega scale field farmer friends. In fact, somebody we went to school on before we got going, you know, 12, 13 years ago in this field. You know, we had the luxury of going to school on some of the most uh, innovative field farmers uh, that were. He would tell you that, 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 that his best quote unquote farm farmers that he's putting onto his 100,000 acres. He's one of the largest organic vegetable growers in, in the United States, that his farm team of, uh, of kids uh, are now engineers, biologists, uh, in fact, folks that didn't go to an ag program because they're much more accepting of change and they're much more accepting of data and technology because his farm and dairy operations is basically a massive technology platform. And um, he also uh, no, made a, a gender note that the uh, most successful farm team recruits that he's had has been generally uh, uh, women graduates of college graduates of those kinds of programs, biology, chem E, engineering you know sort of very data oriented and innovation oriented fields because he's asking people to constantly be changing and absorbing all right if i look at at at, at the universities that are doing the most amount of this um, it's going to be the universities that understand that this is going to be a cross-discipline area and that it's not the ag school it's an ag school that's highly integrated with uh, the engineering and data sciences. Uh, you still have to have ag because these are still operationally intensive places, but, but, but we see that integration becoming critically important. So if you tear apart, for example, the Wagen University winning teams, one of the things you'll note is that it's, they always have a top grower on the team but it's populated by folks that are applied technology, applied software, applied expert systems, um, control mechanisms, people that understand how you manage lighting, how you manage valves. And so it is cross-disciplinary. And I think the most successful programs are gonna be the ones that actually understand this is not about ag as we know it. Absolutely. That is the last question that we have time for, if you can believe it. I feel like this blew by and there are a lot more people who have uh, a lot of questions to ask and are very interested in learning more about what you're doing. I'm going to encourage any of you who still have um, questions to email info at eq-cap.com. And I know the team over at Equilibrium will try to help you get answers to some of those questions. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Dave. I think this has been tremendously informative and gives me a lot of hope for what the future looks like. Um, do you have a closing thought that you'd like to share before I do my shameless plug for GAI? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that, that, that as we dwell on this, um, uh, the idea of inflection and technology, 
I think there's just a couple of words that I'd like to end with. And that is at the end of the day, we're, this is not virtual. We're, 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 we're growing food, right? And so all the care that's needed to be operationally uh, consistent, highest quality productivity, you know, these are all still incredibly important drivers. So it's not hands off. The, the second thing that I think is critically important and shouldn't be lost is that there are many ways to invest in agriculture. And we respect the many ways that there are to invest in agriculture. What I wanted to introduce today was this thought about why agriculture's historic roots in land-based investing is very appropriate for many of the strategies I articulated and advantages that I articulated. But what we also see is that as technology hits agriculture and consumer and retailer needs change and hit agriculture, that there's now this inflection moment where there are now other models that are to be considered and they're not about replacing, but they're just about adding to the opportunity set that, that we think is quite exciting. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, you know, as much as we are all desperate to bring the community together and see you all in person sometime very soon, uh, the world is just not allowing us to do it. However, we can bring you together in a digital way, and we'll be doing that next month with Global Ag Investing. And please do come over to globalaginvesting.com to learn a little bit more about that event. We're going to have a very robust way for you all to network with each other, hopefully do business together, learn from each other. Um, and that will be open starting on August 3rd. Um, and the event itself will take place August 25th through 27th. So please do go to globalaginvesting.com to check that out. And please go learn more about what they're doing at Equilibrium. And thank you so much. This is the end of season one of the GAI webinar series. We'll, we'll be back after our event in August, but we look forward to hopefully seeing all of you there. Thank you for following along and for being engaged. And I hope that you all learned a lot today. Thanks so much, Dave. Thank you.